morning or joining us online, it is my joy and delight to welcome you to the forum where each week we hold sacred conversations about the things that matter. And this week, as we approach uh, our annual cherished holiday of Thanksgiving on Thursday, we have with us a uh, professor of history at George Washington University, David Silverman. His, he's the author of many books. He works on American history and Native American history. Uh, his, his most recent book is called This Land is Their Land, The Wampanoag Indians, Plymouth County, and the Troubled History of Thanksgiving. So you can tell why he's here today uh, to give us a sense of that uh, Thanksgiving myth that we all learned in school, how much of it is accurate, uh, spoiler, not that much, and um, what, we, what we make of it. Um, his book is also available in the bookstore, so um, if you're uh, intrigued by what he has to say today, I encourage you to visit the bookstore, and if you catch him before he leaves, he, you might even get him to sign it. So, uh, Professor Silverman, it's great to have you here. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Reverend Thompson, for the, the invitation, and uh, you know, for all your hospitality leading up to this point. I genuinely appreciate it. It's always great to be back in New York, even though I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Red Sox fan. <laughs> Um, I will warn you uh, up front, I'm going to give you plenty of material to ruin your family's Thanksgiving. Um, I realize, of course, many of you are capable of doing that without my assistance, um, but uh, you'll have even more material to work with uh, this season. So for generations, Americans have been telling themselves a patriotic story of the first Thanksgiving that treats colonization as a consensual, bloodless affair. In this tale, and you're all familiar with it, the pilgrims, religious dissenters from England, cram aboard the Mayflower, which we see here, to brave the stormy Atlantic in search of freedom of conscience in America. These sea-tossed adventurers land off Cape Cod with a copy of their proto-constitution, the Mayflower Compact, and after some fruitless searching and brief confrontations with the natives, decide to found their new settlement up the coast at a place they call Plymouth. Yet the future of the colony is very much in doubt during its first couple of months because the Indians, rarely identified by tribe, on whom the English know they must depend for food and protection, seem to be at best wary and shy and at worst hostile. However, Eventually, the natives reach out to the newcomers through the interpreters, Samoset and Squanto. The tales we grew up with avoid the obvious question of how these figures had managed to learn English, nor do our typical tellings explain why the natives suddenly became so friendly. The natives' chief, Usamequin, who the English know by his title, Massasoit, even agrees to a treaty of alliance with Plymouth. Over the spring and summer, the Indians feed the pilgrims and teach them how to plant corn and where to fish, whereupon the colony begins to thrive. And that fall, of course, the two parties seal their alliance with the famous first Thanksgiving. The peace that follows, we're taught, permits colonial New England, and by extension, modern America, to become blessed seats of freedom, democracy, Christianity in plenty. As for what happens to the Indians next, the story has nothing to say. The native's gift is to present America to white people, or in other words, to concede to colonialism. Think of the other famous Indians from early American history, like Pocahontas or Sacagawea. The role of these native people is to help the colonizers and then move off stage. So you know, white Americans love Indians who helped. Now the Wampanoags of what is now southeastern Massachusetts, who are the native people in this drama, have long contended that this tale is not history. But it's a myth that sugarcoats the viciousness of colonialism for indigenous people. My book reckons with this uncomfortable truth and its implications. So for instance, in traditional accounts of Thanksgiving, the pilgrims step onto Plymouth Rock and into a new world, right, or wilderness. We use these terms to this very day. When in fact, human civilization in the Americas was every bit as rich and ancient as in Europe. And indeed, 
every archaeological find moves the date farther and farther back. Just within the, few, uh, the last few months, there was an archaeological find of human activity in the Americas 22,000 years old. History clearly didn't begin for the Wampanoags or any other native people with the arrival of the Mayflower or any other European vessel. They already had a dynamic past, countless generations old, that shaped who they were and what they did. So in other words, they inhabited an old world. And the so-called wilderness in which the English arrived, clearly it was full of villages, roads, cornfields, historic monuments, cemeteries, and forests cleared of underbrush, all by native design. And you can see that in this drawing of the Wampanoag community of Patuxet, the very site where the English would found Plymouth. But this is a drawing of the place 15 years before the English arrived. And this was drawn by the French explorer Samuel de Champlain in 1605. What you're seeing here, these are wigwams or Witus, native people's homes, all of them surrounded by cornfields ringing what we now know as Plymouth Harbor. So the Wampanoag's ancient history mattered, and their recent history mattered too. Though the Thanksgiving myth might have us believe that the Pilgrim Wampanoag encounter was a first contact episode, in fact, it was just one in a long string of bloody meetings between the Wampanoags and Europeans since, focus on the state, 1524. So practically a century before the arrival of the Mayflower. And from 1602 onward, these contacts became regular affairs with several such uh, meetings during every summer season. Another drawing by Samuel de Champlain gives you a sense of how these encounters tended to go. The Thanksgiving myth would have us believe that the Wampanoags were timid and shy, overawed by the pilgrims. But I show in my book that the Wampanoags were easily the stronger party during Plymouth's early years. What you're seeing here is a map of Wampanoag country during the period in question. Let's be clear, the English did not dictate to the Wampanoags when they founded Plymouth. Instead, the Wampanoags initially used Plymouth as a pawn in their tribal and intertribal politics. In particular, they tried to direct English aggression toward their intertribal rivals, the Narragansett people to the west, Moreover, their leader, Usamequin, tried to funnel English trade through him in order to enhance his authority and reconsolidate the Wampanoag polity, which was under enormous stress, as I'll get to in a moment. It might come as a surprise to some of you, and even a disappointment, to find out that the Thanksgiving feast actually played, and there was a Thanksgiving feast, but that it actually played a minor role in this relationship. Hardly anyone uh, thought it was all that important at the moment in time. Far more influential were a series of other less palatable episodes filled with violence and power politics, not the stuff of a national founding myth. I also submit that our emphasis on the nearly 50 years of peace between the Wampanoags and the English, following the first Thanksgiving and its associated treaty of 1621, memorialized in these images here, elides the more important point, that the Wampanoags fairly quickly came to, regret, uh, to resent the colonists' aggressive and often underhanded dealing. The truth is that the English and the Wampanoags nearly came to blows repeatedly during that supposed long peace. And that was especially true after 1660 with the death of Usamequin. And these tensions culminate in the terrible King Philip's War of 1675 and 76. Most histories that bother to include the Wampanoags at all typically end with this war. But my book contends that accounting with the Thanksgiving myth as a white lie requires tracing Wampanoag struggles with colonialism through the centuries right up to the present. And I think long-term historical perspectives like this are especially urgent as our country grapples with new manifestations of white nationalism, while at the very same time, indigenous Americans in New England, and indeed all across the country, 
are reasserting their political, economic, and cultural sovereignty. So to explore these themes, I'm going to focus this talk around two cases spread across the centuries in which Wampanoag people posed counter-narratives to white America's triumphalist histories. And the first revisionist historian I want to focus on this morning is none other than the Wampanoag sachem, or chief, known as Pemeticom. Uh, he's been passed down to history as King Philip. In the late spring of 1675, some 50 years after his father, Usamequin or Massasoit, had greeted the pilgrims, Pemeticom sat down to, to talk with a delegation of English magistrates from the colony of Rhode Island. So again, uh, here's a map of Wampanoag country, and the area encircled there is where this meeting took place. Now, the Rhode Islanders were at this talk to encourage the sachem to agree to a peaceful arbitration of the Wampanoag's mounting tensions with Plymouth Colony, which seemed to be leading to war. But Pemeticom had already resolved to fight and agreed to this conference just to explain why. Let's consider what he said that day. Pemeticom said he viewed the history of Wampanoag English relations as little more than the colonists' failure to live up to the promise of the 1621 alliance. He recalled that when the pilgrims first settled at Plymouth 55 years late, uh, earlier, his father, Usamequin, and I quote here, was as a great man, and the English as a little child. Here, by the way, is the mark of his father on an English land deed. Pemeticom contended, correctly, that Usamequin could have wiped out Plymouth Colony if he had wished, but instead he held back its native enemies, fed the starving colonists, and granted them ample tracts of land. Now, like most people who are telling the histories of their own families, Pemeticom was selective in what he decided to discuss this day. He conveniently left out that his father had made this choice less out of altruism than a need for allies. Fact was that the Wampanoags had been hobbled by a plague introduced by Europe between 1616 and 1619, so just before the arrival of the Mayflower, and in their weakness, in the Wampanoag's weakness, their Narragansett rivals to the west had begun subjugating them. So Usamequin is looking to the English as potential military allies to defend Wampanoag sovereignty. He also left out that Usamequin was interested in becoming the point man in English trade in order to reconsolidate that Wampanoag polity that had been eviscerated by the disease. But generally speaking, Pemeticom was on the mark. That, that Plymouth would have become yet another in an already long history of English lost colonies had it not been for Wampanoag largesse. And how did Plymouth show its gratitude? Decades later, now that it had become the great man. Well, Pemeticom, and you see his mark here on another English land deed, he denounced that in English courts, and I quote again, if 20 honest Indians testified that an Englishman had done them wrong, it was as nothing. But if one of the worst Indians testified against any Indian suspected by the English, that was sufficient. The English had begun to interfere in criminal matters between Wampanoags within Wampanoag territory, including recently executing three of Pemeticom's leading men for the assassination of a Christian Wampanoag who had been leaking Wampanoag intelligence to colonial authorities. Pemeticom railed, and I quote here, whatever was only between Indians and not in English townships, they would not have us prosecute. In other words, mind your own business. About half of the Wampanoags, mostly on Cape Cod and the islands of Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, had adopted Christianity, and as part of that decision, sworn off Pemeticom's leadership, including the responsibility to pay him tribute. They feared no reprisal for making this break because by virtue of their Christianity, they now enjoyed English protection. What you're seeing here is a page from, one of the, from the first Bible ever printed in North America. It's in the Wampanoag language. <laughs> 
And the reason you're seeing Wampanoag marginalia here is that the mission schools taught Wampanoag people alphabetic literacy in their own language. It had never been put um, to the alphabet before. If the, all this wasn't enough, there were still other issues. The English used land deeds, some fair, quite a number foul, to claim Wampanoag territory for their own exclusive use under their own exclusive jurisdiction, which ran contrary to the natives' expectation that these land sales merely conveyed permission for the English to settle among them, with the expectation that the English would abide according to Wampanoag customs. Well, when native people resisted, colonists flooded these contested tracts with livestock and slapped any native people who injured the animals, four-legged trespassers after all, with trumped up criminal fines and lawsuits. The point was to force holdout natives to resign themselves to the English interpretations of these deeds. Such machinations, machinations rather, gave the colonists, as Pometicom put it, and I quote, 100 times more land than now the king, he meant him, Pometicom himself, had for his people. To the Wampanoags then, English law was but a shakedown by people with short memories and thin loyalty. The Rhode Islanders at this conversation, seeing where it was heading, this is not what they intended. Um, they cautioned Pometicom that it would be suicidal if he and his people took up arms against the colonists because, as they put it, the English were too strong for them. Sachem was ready for this. He retorted, then the English should do to them, the Wampanoags, as they did when they were too strong for the English. In other words, he called on the colonists to assume the role of the great man by acting with generosity, restraint, and justice toward the Wampanoag little child. And that's where this conference ended, because everyone knew this wish was futile. Just days later, Pometicom led a Wampanoag force against nearby English towns, prompting a war that would engulf the entire region and ultimately break the back of indigenous power in southern New England. This horrific war is the most basic feature of the English-Wampanoag relationship that the Thanksgiving myth studiously ignores. Initially, Wampanoag resistance fight fighters got the best of it by sacking exposed English settlements and ambushing troops on the march. Furthermore, soon they had the support of many other native people, the Nipmucks from central Massachusetts, their old Narragansett rivals, various Abnaki peoples from up and down the Connecticut River Valley, whom the colonists turned from neutrals into enemies by suspecting them as a Trojan horse and seizing their weaponry and demanding them to turn over Wampanoag non-combatants who had taken refuge with them. The warring Indians took advantage of these colonial missteps to take the lives of upwards of 3,000 Englishmen, destroy 16 colonial towns, and slaughter upwards of 800 head of cattle. Eventually, however, the resistance collapsed, in no small part because many other native people threw in their lot with the English. So focus your attention to this part of the map right on the modern day Massachusetts, New York border. So in the early winter of 1676, so February 1676, the Mohawks, the easternmost most nations, uh, nation of the Five Nations Iroquois or Haudenosaunee people, as a gesture to the young English colony of New York attacked the winter camp where Pometicom and his allies uh, were spending the winter, largely so they would have access to Dutch gunrunners in Albany and French gunrunners from Canada. And they drove them eastward back into the teeth of colonial New England forces. And the Mohawks weren't the only tribe to side with the English. Other tribes were also lying in wait. The Mohicans and Pequots of what's now Connecticut, and the various Christian Wampanoags of Cape Cod and the islands, who under duress, let's be clear, had sided with the colonies from the beginning and were just as adept as the resistance fighters at forest warfare. Meanwhile, 
The warring Indians and their families were stalked by hunger and disease as they lived on the run, away from their cornfields and fishing stations. Consequently, by the late spring and early summer of 1676, growing numbers of them began to accept an English offer of quarter, or mercy, in exchange for switching sides. Others escaped this terrible choice, which I think in so many ways crystallizes colonialism, by escaping to the French Catholic missions of Canada or to the upper Hudson River Valley. And they built new lives there, but most of them didn't make it that far. By June 1676, native prisoners were telling their English captors that Pometacom, and I quote, was ready to die, for you would have now killed or taken nearly all his relations and nearly broke his heart. Those relations included his wife, Watuna Kanuski, and one of their sons, we don't know his name, who the colonists captured and sold into the horrors of West Indian slavery. They were but two of an estimated 2,000 indigenous people, men, women, and children alike, who the English sentenced to slavery and sold throughout the Atlantic world. Some of these poor souls had surrendered based on that promise of mercy, only to discover that the terms were far harsher than they had been led to believe. Worse still, some surrendering natives learned too late the colonists were not going to spare any native man they suspected of having taken an English life, and their standard for making this judgment was not very strict. Plymouth and Rhode Island held public executions throughout the spring and summer of 1676. Boston held 50 executions that summer, right on Boston Common, which has yet to memorialize this event and they exacted retribution on the dead. On August 6, 1676, colonial forces discovered the drowned body of Weedamu, a female Wampanoag leader and the sister of Pometacom's wife. They discovered her around this site here. Authorities ordered her head to be severed and piked next to a holding pen full of Wampanoag prisoners, who, according to English accounts, made a most horrid and diabolical lamentation, crying out, it was their queen's head. A few days later, Pometacom was dead too, shot down by a Christian Wampanoag who the English called Alderman. Filled with a vengeful spirit, Captain Benjamin Church had the sachem dismembered and his head sent to Plymouth. And there, on the very site where the sachem's father had allied and feasted with Plymouth, the authorities mounted their grisly trophy on the town gate and left it there to rot for 20 years. I think we can all agree that this is as antithetical to the Thanksgiving story as it gets, all the more so when we realize that later that week, Plymouth held a day of Thanksgiving in praise of God for saving the colony from its enemies. Now, most histories that bother to treat the Wampanoags at all typically end with this war. But I emphasize that this is just the first stage in a centuries-long Wampanoag battle to defend their land and sovereignty. It should come as no surprise to any of us that the English seized nearly all the Wampanoags' land in the decades after the war leaving only a handful of town-sized reservations pictured here on the map for mostly Christian Indians. Less well known is that the colonists also seized the Wampanoags as bound laborers. From the late 1600s through the early 1800s, white merchant creditors, courts, and government-appointed guardians colluded to force the Wampanoags and their children, let me stress, into indentured servitude to white farmers, householders, and whaling merchants, with the terms typically lasting several years, and sometimes even decades. Uh, one of my colleagues makes the argument that we should call this judicial slavery, and I, I think she's quite right. So many Wampanoag children wound up as servants to the English that few Wampanoags could speak their natal language by the early 1800s. For such reason, reasons, William Apis, a Pequot who served as a preacher to the Mashpee Wampanoags of Cape Cod, 
wrote what he called a eulogy to King Philip in 1836, in which he proposed that Massasoit's welcome to the Mayflower passengers was a grave mistake. Therefore, he proposed, stick a pin in this, Native people should treat every December 22nd, the anniversary of the Mayflower's arrival in Plymouth, and every 4th of July as what he called days of mourning and not joy. Let them rather fast and pray to the Great Spirit, the Indian's God, who deals out mercy to his red children and not destruction. Despite unyielding assaults on their communities, the Wampanoags stubbornly persisted, which Massachusetts addressed in the late 1860s and 1870s by dissolving their reservations of Herring Pond, Mashpee, Gayhead, Chappaquiddick, and Christiantown. The state divided the common lands of these places into private property tracts, subject to confiscation for debt and unpaid taxes, and they are, then declared the, the inhabitants to be full-fledged citizens and no longer Indians, as if these things were antithetical. White officials refused to listen to Native people who protested that this supposed gift of citizenship was actually a Trojan horse to rob them of their remaining land and force them to scatter. And that was the point. At their more honest moments, which we have because of personal correspondence, white proponents of this measure admitted they considered the Wampanoags to be too racially intermixed to be classified as Indians any longer. And that in any case, it was the fate, the manifest destiny of Indians to vanish. And over the next century, Americans did everything they could to make that supposedly natural process occur, including reducing Native people to romantic bit parts in the country's history, as exemplified by the Thanksgiving myth. Let me be clear here. Throughout the colonial era, throughout the 1600s, the 1700s, even into the 1800s, Thanksgiving had no association with pilgrims and Indians. The link between the holiday and the mythic history appears to date to 1841, when the Reverend Alexander Young published one of two very short <laughs> primary source accounts of a 1621 harvest feast hosted by Plymouth Colony and attended by neighboring Wampanoags. And to it, Thompson added an influential footnote. Please trust me as a historian, there aren't a lot of influential footnotes out there. This is one of them. And this footnote read, here it is, this was the first Thanksgiving the Harvest Festival of New England. Over the next 50 years, various authors, artists, and lecturers, you know, the Emersons, the Thoreaus of the day, disseminated Young's idea until Americans took it for granted. I dream of having a footnote so influential. I, I'm gonna, I will tell you. No. Quite, predictably, New Englanders were the first to tout the pilgrims as national founding fathers and their dinner with the, the Indians as a template for Thanksgiving. But it took a lot for the rest of the country to go along. The nation, for instance, first had to subjugate the tribes of the Far West, the Great Plains. Only then could the nation as a whole stop vilifying indigenous people as bloodthirsty savages and give them an unthreatening role in a national founding myth. This saga also took hold because it was useful in the nation's culture wars, which raged then as now. It was no coincidence that the pilgrims emerged as founding fathers amid popular anxiety over, strike up the band, immigration. In this case, though, the fear was that the country was being overrun by Catholic and then later Jewish and Eastern Orthodox immigrants, supposedly unappreciative of the country's Protestant democratic origins and values. Additionally, treating the pilgrims, really an obscure minor group in the history of colonial America, but treating them as the epitome of colonial America served to minimize the country's record of racial oppression, past and present. Better to highlight the pilgrims' religious and democratic values instead of the Indian wars and slavery more typical of colonial history including New England. Through such means, 
Northeasterners could define the so-called black and Indian problems as Southern and Western exceptions to an otherwise inspiring national heritage. So what I'm saying here is that though Americans today widely assume that Thanksgiving had been associated with pilgrims and Indians since 1621, that tradition is a product of white Northern Protestants in the 19th century asserting their cultural authority over European immigrants, Americans of color, and other American regions. But this invention became tradition by the early 20th century and has remained so in no small part through American public schools holding annual Thanksgiving pageants in which students dress up as pilgrims and Indians to reenact the first Thanksgiving. I myself remember participating in one such event. Uh, I was cast as a tree, by the way. Um, and in it, we sang, My Country Tis of Thee, in which we praised America as a sweet land of liberty and the pilgrims as my fathers. My name's Silverman. The point of this exercise was to have a diverse group of school children learn about who we as Americans are, or at least who we're supposed to be. Even students from ethnic backgrounds would be instilled with the principles of representative government, liberty, and Christianity, while learning to identify with English colonists from hundreds of years ago as fellow white people. And leaving natives outside the category of my fathers also carried an important message about which race ran the country and whose values mattered. By 1970, Frank James, our second revisionist historian, had reached the limits of his patience with this nonsense. He was born and raised in the Wampanoag community of Gay Hedder Aquina, which had long ranked among the poorest communities in Massachusetts. But he grew up determined to succeed and represent his people. His talents even brought him all the way to the New England Conservatory, uh, where my grandfather taught, where he studied trumpet and then to the Nauset Public Schools on Cape Cod, where he became director of music. But his passion was history. And what he read in the primary sources made his blood boil, because it bore little relation to the Thanksgiving myth that weighed around his people's neck like a millstone. So, when James was invited to speak at a state banquet celebrating the 350th anniversary of Plymouth's founding, he saw, saw it as a rare opportunity to set the record straight. But when he submitted his speech for review, white officials rejected it as too inflammatory. They gave him an alternative script, which he found so childish and untrue that he pulled out of the event altogether and instead decided to organize a commemoration with no censors. Inspired by the Red Power Movement for Indigenous Rights and Justice, James organized a National Day of Mourning to be held on Thanksgiving Day 1970 at the site of the Massasoit statue overlooking Plymouth Rock. In choosing that name, Day of Mourning, James hearkened not only to recent National Days of Mourning following the assassinations of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, he reached back to 1836 when William Apis proposed that that's how Native people should memorialize the beginning of colonialism in America. And on this day in 1970, he delivered his inflammatory speech. He began with the poignant assertion that he had the dignity of his humanity despite society's efforts to diminish him and his people. He acknowledged to his white listeners that Thanksgiving, and I quote, is a day of celebration for you celebrating the beginnings of the white man in America. For James and his people, the day had doleful implications. James proceeded to tell a history of English Wampanoag relations that turned the bedtime story of the Thanksgiving myth into a nightmare. And his conclusion was that Usamequin's welcome of the pilgrims was, quote, perhaps our biggest mistake. We, the Wampanoags, welcomed you, the white man, with open arms, little knowing that it was the beginning of the end, that before 50 years were to pass, the Wampanoags would no longer be a free people. 
To James, like Pometicom of centuries before, the moral of the first Thanksgiving was that the English and their successors had betrayed the Wampanoags and other indigenous people who befriended them in their time of need. And that's the message that has echoed through subsequent National Days of Mourning that take place annually right up to, well, this week. As for the question of how to move forward, James's answer is to confront history with open eyes, including the critical fact that the Wampanoags are still here. He urged Americans to consider their native counterparts as worthy of the same respect as everyone else, believing that if they followed this counsel, it would make Thanksgiving Day 1970, and I quote, a new beginning toward a more humane America, a more Indian America, in which Native people could regain the position in this country that is rightfully ours. There are so many reasons for Americans to take this counsel and try to tell the history of Plymouth and the Wampanoags in a three-dimensional way, especially around the time of Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is the focal point for considering the Native American role in the nation's past. And I think it's bad enough to have gotten the story so wrong for so long, but now it's downright inexcusable to, consider, to continue this annual tradition of having teachers, politicians, and television producers traffic in the Thanksgiving myth, and residential homes and shopping centers decorated with happy pilgrims and Indians. We see these. I'm sure you're all accustomed to seeing these things, right? These practices dismiss Native people's very real historical traumas at white hands in favor of casting their ancestors as having consented to colonialism. To call the consequences harmless is to ignore the chorus of Native Americans, our fellow Americans, who say the hurt is profound, particularly to their children in the schools. In a pluralistic country, it's morally unacceptable, I think, to allow the celebration of a national holiday to damage part of the nation's people. Never mind the first people. Or for that matter, all the people. This country has not reflected at all about how the Thanksgiving myth teaches white proprietorship of the nation. Why, alluding back to my earlier comments, should a school-aged child with the surname of, say, Silverman identify more with the Pilgrims than the Indians? After all, such a student is unlikely to descend from either group, and the descendants of both groups are Silverman's fellow Americans. If the student is taught to think like a historian, I'm not holding out hope, <laughs> more dispassionately, um, thinking of the historical actors as they instead of we, it might be a means of capturing uh, history more three-dimensionally, when we can see the actors as fully human with all of the virtues and shortcomings that one would expect to find in any population. If the student is taught to think of both groups more inclusively as we, acutely aware of the associated risk of appropriation, it might be a step toward a more compassionate national culture. And boy, could we use it. But if the public continues to associate pilgrim-Indian relations with Thanksgiving, I don't think we need to. Let's be clear what I'm trying to say here. Have a lovely holiday with your family. What a wonderful ritual. Get together, offer uh, thanks for what's good in our lives. Leave the history out, the, the false history out of it. We don't have to marry these two things. But if we're going to, the least we can do is get the story straight with Wampanoag actors and perspectives at the center. Imagine if we as a country on Thanksgiving reckoned with the story as told by Pometicom and Frank James. I'm not naive. I know the challenges are significant at many different levels. Many Americans, especially white Americans, are uncomfortable with the Native American past. It tends to turn patriotic episodes inside out and heroes into villains, or at least into deeply flawed heroes. It loosens 
white claims on morality and authority. It raises political and cultural questions about justice. It threatens to tear down monuments and rename buildings. But confronting this history, confronting this darkness, also promises to shed light and cultivate national humility. And I think most importantly, signal to our native country people that the nation values them as us. One gracious Wampanoag elder once told me, we do ourselves no good by hiding from the truth. And I think she was talking about all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Silverman, um, for that very powerful talk. Uh, we have just a few minutes for questions. If you're here in the room, my colleague Bailey Regan has question cards she can distribute to you and collect. Uh, and if you're online, you can um, offer your questions on the live chat on YouTube, the comments function on Facebook, or you can email me, pthompson at stbarts.org. Professor Silverman, um, I was thinking about Frank James's National Day of Mourning speech and yep. noticed parallels to Frederick Douglass's mm -hmm. 4th of July address. Mm -hmm. right. and I'm wondering if that's something you've thought about and what you're reflecting on. I have. Um, so there's no doubt that Frank James was re reading William Apis. So remember, William Apis is writing in the 1830s. And William Apis's time overlaps with that of Frederick Douglass's activism. Um, William Apis was activist was active in abolitionist circles. He almost certainly was aware of Frederick Douglass's act activities and the, the more general principle on which Frederick Douglass, Douglass had drawn, which is that the country's universal egalitarian principles obviously um, were not applied to the country's people of color, especially African slaves. Uh, we have a question from someone who, who wonders how the myth-making around Thanksgiving parallels other kinds of American myth-making and maybe myth-making in other countries and contexts. We are not unique as a country in expecting a, a, a history education to cultivate little patriots. That's been the purpose of history education since the beginning of human society. Human society wants history to support the status quo, not to shake it. I am very fortunate to exist in a rare time and place where I have a society that supports my criticism of the society. I don't take it for granted. In most times and places, I'd be thrown in the gulag, right? And there's a burgeoning um, a body of opinion in this country that would <laughs> like that to occur, uh, occur again. Um, so all countries, including our own, are awash in myth. Think of uh, the, the preeminent myth that applies to Native people, which is manifest destiny, which still shapes our national conversations about history. When people say they believe in American exceptionalism, that is a, a new suit of clothes for the old idea of manifest destiny. The idea that God wanted white people to spread across the continent physically and with their institutions because it is good for humankind, that it brings democracy, opportunity, and salvation. Well, that's one perspective. But if you're indigenous, you have a completely different view of what that process involved. Um, so, yes, I mean, we, we are awash in all sorts of, of myths of this type. We have a few questions about the custom of the National Day of Mourning and to yeah. what extent it's spread beyond Plymouth. Are there observances in yeah. New York City? Um, how is it um, observed around the country? Um, so, you know, this started small and has gotten big. Um, my understanding is many native, not, not all, I, I, one of my Wampanoag colleagues says, ask 10 Native people about Thanksgiving and they'll give you 10 different answers about how their family celebrate it, right? Some traditionally, some mix mourning and, and offers of thanks. Others dispense with the holiday altogether. Um, but um, Native people across the country in increasing numbers have taken this holiday as an opportunity to mourn and reflect. 
um, and to hold public events to encourage other fellow Americans uh, to do the same. But there's no one uniform response. The, the Puritans had a custom of, of giving thanks, and in mm -hmm. some ways yep. the, the idea for Thanksgiving came from them. Can you talk about that? Yes. So all peoples around the world hold Thanksgivings, right? It's just, it just dep depends on what you call it. Uh, Wampanoag people, indeed, will say, well, we held Thanksgivings all the time throughout the year. We should do it more often. I think they're right. Um, the English had a tradition of declaring days of Thanksgiving well before the colonial era began. You know, whenever a drought ends, whenever it is a victory in war, whenever they avert some kind of disaster, the government would declare a day of Thanksgiving. It could happen any time in the year. It became standardized to hold it in, in November. Um, but, uh, you know, that, th that, that was uh, not the practice before that, that time. Um, point is, both groups of people held Thanksgivings. Um, it's the English tradition that has uh, led to our own, to be sure, though. And Abraham Lincoln had a role at some point? He did. Uh, so in 1863, you know, amid uh, a time of division, <laughs> uh, he under, you know, he was being uh, pressured by um, numerous groups, including a, uh, a, a woman who published the Ladies' Home Journal. She thought it was a good idea to have some kind of holiday that would help bring Americans together. And so he, he bowed to the pressure. In 1863, took what had been a Yankee holiday, a Northeastern holiday, Southerners didn't practice, uh, hold Thanksgivings, um, and he declared it to be a national holiday, and it stuck. So we, we have to stop now, but a, a final question. You, you said that we can celebrate the holiday and reckon with the history at the same time. I'm wondering what Thanksgiving looks for you, looks right. like for you, as having spent so much time with this history. Sure. Um, let's be clear about what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I'm not declaring war on Thanksgiving. I am not calling to cancel Thanksgiving. I love Thanksgiving. I am a voracious pie eater. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is the holiday that, uh, that speaks to me. I don't think we need to attach this false and I think damaging history to the wonderful ritual of getting together with family and friends and offering thanks for what's good in our lives. The two do not have to go together. And indeed, if you're a traditionalist at heart, you should be aware, a traditional Thanksgiving did not marry the two. It's a fairly recent invention, uh, this idea. Again, so Thanksgivings were held by white people for centuries without invoking pilgrims and Indians. Um, my family is all too aware of my opinions about the history of the holiday. <laughs> um, one day, I, one, one uh, holiday, I introduced a centerpiece, which was a pilgrim hat with arrows in it. My mom did not take too kindly uh, to that. I will, I will, uh, I will tell you. Um, but I, you know, I, I will say this. Uh, you know, for those who are not immersed in this history uh, like I am, you know, maybe it is a good opportunity to educate yourself and then educate your fellow family members, as long as it's not going to ruin the holiday. I mean, nobody wants to fight on Thanksgiving. Um, maybe even a better idea, and this is my idea, how about we take Native American history seriously in our history curriculum? That would be a start and not relegate it to one season a year. Well, unfortunately, we do have to stop there. Thank you for this sobering but very powerful reflection today. Thank really you so much for having it. me and, my, and your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. We hope you'll stick around and join us for worship at 11 a.m. And we hope you'll be back for the forum next week. Our own rector, Bishop Dean Wolf, is going to be talking about uh, why we have bishops in the Episcopal Church as we prepare to elect the next bishop of New York. See you then.